You might know XRP as one of the fastest and most scalable cryptocurrencies in the world today. A whopping $76 billion in payments are sent through a vast network of banks every day. Ripple is a tech company in San Francisco that wants to help banks move that cash from point A to point B faster and more cheaply. Ripple wants to do that by utilizing a digital token called XRP. But did you also know that it was designed to operate at $10,000 per coin? So is Ripple the next big breakout coin? What Ripple really is going after is the SWIFT network or international payment transfer. So what you're talking about here is an upgrade of the international financial system. And that's a very big market. The obvious question you might be asking now is, can it go that high? Let's find out. If this is your first time here, make sure you subscribe and click on the bell so you don't miss any new videos. When XRP was created, it was designed to be a replacement for both institutional and retail financial systems in every market around the world. How do we know this? If we take a closer look at how XRP is constructed, it becomes obvious. A famous quote from Ripple Labs co-founder Arthur Brito provides us with an interesting clue. In 2017, he wrote, XRP must be scalable to accommodate 7.5 billion people. This quote provides insight into the scale of Ripple's ambitions to be used by the global population. First, let's examine some of the main features of XRP that support the claim that it was designed to carry $10,000 of value per coin. XRP's primary use case is to enable cross-border payments that are faster, cheaper, and more reliable than existing systems such as SWIFT. Ripple CEO Brad Gullinghouse, he joins us right now. Some say Ripple could be the next Bitcoin. What do you think, Brad? Is that a compliment that Ripple could be the next Bitcoin? Well, I think if we're solving a real problem and it's a, at scale, uh, then I think it's a compliment. Some, I think, may look back on Bitcoin and find that it was the Napster of digital assets. What I mean by that is Napster was the first to digitize music and demonstrate, hey, if you digitize music, you can do a lot of cool things with that. But ultimately, they were circumventing trademark laws, they were circumventing royalty payments, and government stepped in and Napster was not successful. But Spotify, iTunes, Pandora, they were very successful. I think what you'll find is that maybe the next generation of digital assets ends up solving some of the original problems that Bitcoin set out to solve. So Ripple Net is trying to take on Swift. What's been the traction light? Who's come on board? Well, it's interesting as you step back and look at this. If you and I decided we we're going to send $10,000 to California today, the fastest way for us to do it would be to drive to the airport and fly it there. That's a crazy thing to think about when you're in the age of the internet and you know, we're used to information on demand. When we think about the, the customers that have come on board, it's because we're solving that real problem. We're changing the nature of a payment taking days to settle to California to seconds. So we now have well over 100 customers ranging from some of the biggest banks in the world to payment providers to the Western unions and MoneyGrams, Linlin Pay out of China. Back to your question, is, is XRP the next Bitcoin? If we work with the system to solve this problem, and we can solve that problem at scale, a problem measured in the trillions of dollars, then there's a lot of opportunity to create value in XRP. Essentially, XRP is trying to provide a reliable on-demand source of liquidity for cross-border payments. Now, let's define liquidity. Liquidity describes the degree to which an asset or security can be quickly bought or sold in the market without affecting the asset's price. What we see in today's market is price volatility as a relatively small number of investors buy and sell XRP on exchanges. Liquidity for XRP or any other crypto comes as the price rises. Higher prices equals higher liquidity. The fact that Ripple Labs locked up 55% of the total XRP in timed release escrow accounts and has been disciplined in relocking the unsold portions of each release will help to eventually drive the price higher. Even though institutional partners are likely buying XRP over the counter from these releases, this is not reflected in the published exchange prices. During the last 6 months, XRP's price has ranged from 25 cents all the way up to 60 cents, which represents a 120% range either side. Even though this seems like massive movement, it is not problematic for institutional use because of XRP's fast 3 second settlement times. 
big part of the of the value proposition of Ripple, I think, is the cryptocurrency, the XRP. Um, there, we do find that the banks are also they are hesitant to to convert things into a cryptocurrency right now because of the, the volatility in the, the currencies, because of the fact that you don't have the deep liquidity that you have in, for example, the dollar. I hear people talk about volatility, and I feel like they're propagating misinformation. The, the, the volatility risk of fiat, it, you know, well, volatility is just a mathematical calculation of time times volatility. If you hold fiat for, let's say, an average SWIFT transaction today is in the order of magnitude two days, that's about 180,000 seconds. An XRP transaction is three seconds. So if you take a low volatile asset times a long duration, fiat, or a high volatility asset versus a very, very short amount of time, it turns out mathematically there's less volatility risk in an XRP transaction than there is in a fiat transaction. The difference is you have market makers. When you do a SWIFT transaction, there's banks saying, there's a market maker saying, I'll lock in that rate. I'll take the volatility risk for the next two or three days. With XRP, you don't have to do that because it settles so quickly. What is problematic, however, is that this price movement was driven by relatively small retail investments. To move value on the scale of SWIFT's $5 trillion of daily transactions requires much more liquidity than is available in today's XRP pool. If 45 billion XRP are available, this would require a price of approximately $111 per XRP. We know that some of the XRP supply has been burned or lost lost via lost private keys, and a much larger percentage is probably locked up as long-term investors hold XRP. Thus, an even smaller supply of XRP requires an even higher price to provide the minimum liquidity to accommodate SWIFT. International payments, retail payments, credit cards, and institutional and retirement investments such as Grayscale and Morgan Creek Capital will drive demand for liquidity. This increase in liquidity will also raise the price which provides the liquidity, which creates a circle in which demand increases price, which increases liquidity, which increases demand. Once this cycle gains momentum, it's almost impossible to stop it. It has so much energy. So how high can this go? As of October 2017, it was calculated that the value of the world's asset classes totaled $1.14 quadrillion, with above ground gold at $7.7 trillion, global stock markets at $73 trillion, global money supply $90.4 trillion, global debt $215 trillion, global real estate $217 trillion, and derivative markets at $500 and 44 trillion. If the entire 1.14 quadrillion dollar value of all asset classes was tokenized via XRP, that would require at least $11,400 per coin. This example clearly demonstrates the scale of liquidity that XRP is designed to handle. For customers that want to take advantage of using a digital asset like XRP for liquidity, what that means is instead of pre-funding literally the trillions of dollars that banks have with other banks around the world. They pre-fund that amount that sits there. It's really dormant cash sitting there. With digital assets, you can make that much more real time to enable a payment across a, a border into another currency in real time. How much money is pre-funded and how long does it typically sit there? There's $27 trillion sitting in these bank-to-bank -bank accounts. They're called Nostra accounts, Vostra accounts. Yeah. It, it, it really is a problem that if we can reduce the time, the friction, the cost, we really can accelerate global commerce, and by reducing that friction, you accelerate that engine. It's good across the board. It's good for both companies in the United States. It's good for the unbanked communities across Africa. Uh, it, it really can fundamentally change the way the global financial infrastructure Wait, is wired. But what about the other end? divisibility. There is a maximum supply of 100 billion XRP being divisible by six decimal places, meaning that the smallest unit is one millionth of one XRP. Think about this. Why would XRP's designers make the token so divisible in the first place? At a value of 40 cents per coin, this is absurd. After all, who could possibly require the use of one millionth of 40 cents? You wouldn't do that unless you plan for the token to be much higher where it currently is. But a much higher token value, say $10,000 per XRP, that divisibility makes sense for two reasons low transaction cost and affordability for small retail use.
The minimum transaction cost required by the network for a standard transaction is 10 drops. It sometimes increases due to higher than usual loads. Even in a $10,000 XRP value, the transaction cost still would only be approximately 10 cents. This is still exceptionally cheap. One cent is arguably the smallest denomination that would be necessary to use XRP as a means of transacting everyday retail exchanges even in developing markets. This could provide affordable access to banking and digital financial transactions for even the unbanked. Finally, the, un the unbanked, the, the issue of the unbanked is such a fascinating thing that first worlders don't really think about much, I certainly don't, but explain how that helps. Well, if you think about it today, the, the it, banks want to serve customers as long as they can serve them profitably. If they can't serve a customer profitably, they're not going to do it. So when you talk about a, a migrant workforce, for example, in Africa, that ha, you know, is not obviously making a lot of money and is taking that money from country to country, the cost of using the banking system would actually exceed the, the income that they would have. If we can reduce the friction globally and make it easier for that migrant worker to hold assets, to move those assets without costing them lots of money, they then become part of the banking, the, the kind of global financial community. I think that, you know, we think about an internet of value and Ripple's long-term kind of 10-year vision is how do we enable an internet of value? How do we enable value to move the way information moves today, as you referred to email as an example? It's really bringing those communities into the system and allowing them to participate and benefit from being a part of that financial system. In its 2017 Global Findex database, the World Bank found that about 1.7 billion adults remain unbanked without an account at a financial institution or through a mobile money provider. Approximately half of these unbanked people live in just seven countries, Bangladesh, China, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Nigeria, and Pakistan. The report also noted that because two-thirds of this unbanked population have access to a mobile phone, the door is opening to mobile banking services as long as mobile access can be combined with well-developed payment systems. I can't resist asking you one thing, Patrick. Can you tell us the story of how much you learn from the data and from the data points that are left by transactions that are happening as far as borrowers are concerned, the woman and the market. The story here is we now have a platform and we were looking at this information of one of our key lending platforms. And we discovered that a lot of the transactions, more than 40% of the transactions, take place between three o'clock and uh, five o'clock in the morning. And we began to explore this and also discover that about more than 50% of the people that were borrowing were women. So there was a problem here. Are women in, in Siomniaks, you know, in Kenya? Uh, we, we, wa we wanted to investigate this. But anyway, upon uh, further investigation, we discovered what was going on. Basically, uh, you have traders that are operating in the various markets. They are purchasing in the markets and uh, they are going to sell um, in the street corners and in the kiosks, um, those sort of things. So. They wake up at three o'clock in the morning and uh, borrow from this lending platform. On their cell phone? On their cell phone, they're still in their houses. It's all done on the cell phone. They borrow and they'll get the money. They'll then call a trusted wholesaler and ask for bags of this and the other and uh, pay by their self through their cell phone. They'll then call the person who moves this thing and will then instruct them to deliver at the kiosk. So she'll now wake the kids, feed them, send them to school. And at 6.30, she is at the kiosk with all the products ready to sell and beginning a day. I haven't even left my bed at 6.30 as a governor. And this woman has done all these transactions. These are people who don't have bank accounts but they're still conducting business and they're doing it on their mobile phones. In most of the developing world, you have a lot more people using mobile devices than you have bank accounts. If you can make the financial market available to them, even if they don't have a bank account, you're now opening up a massive new market. And if you make transactions affordable enough, now they're going to use that market. XRP will enable even the unbanked to have access to digital financial tools that are fast, stable, and affordable. The design decisions that went into creating XRP's structure leads us to believe that it was designed to operate at $10,000 and to serve a truly global market. Ripple is looking at humanity scale usage, which is massive. Think of what Google does for information. Ripple will do for value. 
If you made it to the end of this video, let me know in the comments if you're bullish or bearish on XRP in 2019. Also, make sure you subscribe and like this video. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys later.